Hello, everyone. I hope everybody can see us. Okay. Um, welcome to the Physical Review Journal Club. Uh, perhaps you are still a little lost in your Zoom. I don't know. So I will, um, if, if you cannot see who is talking to you right now, you can try to go to the uh, speaker view. You should find me there. So my name is Katiusia Casemiro. I am a physical review editor. And uh, just before we start this meeting, let me just show you um, a few things. Sorry, let me share this screen. I think you guys can see it better now, right? Uh, let me just say a few words. Sorry, ah, it's all in the wrong, okay. A few words about uh, Zoom so that you know. Uh, right now, you should all be muted, perhaps not. Okay, but uh, we hope that you are muted right now. Uh, we are gonna start the session with uh, like 15, 20 minutes presentation, but you are already free to start using the chat function to, to type in your questions if you want. But um, after this talk, you're gonna be free to, to speak. Um, we are going to make you un unmuted, but to have it organized, I ask you that you, if you click here in participants, you should have this other window popping out and you have the raise the hand function. Uh, we ask you that you use that and then you're being called in so that you can uh, really speak. So, and uh, as I said before, you can also use this function here, the speaker or gallery view so that you can see more people in your screen. All right. Uh, I have just one quick announcement to make to you before we start the meeting. Uh, it is my pleasure to let you know that for this community here today, so the quantum information science and technology community, you're gonna gain a new journal specific for you. So, uh, on uh, next Monday, we are launching Peer X Quantum. As I said, this is a topical journal. It is highly selective and uh, an open access journal with an emphasis in uh, publications that show a lasting and profound impact. Uh, there are many nice features in this journal, but I wanna mention just one very briefly right now. Um, we are welcoming the whole community of quantum information for this journal, meaning that on the top of the traditional topics covered by the other physical review journals, we are gonna also welcome um, computer scientists that have a more mathematically oriented focus. And this is one side of the spectrum. On the other side of the spectrum, we are also welcoming engineers. So I hope you consider this journal when you are submitting your next exciting result. So you can find more information on the website and also know that the APCs are waived to the end of 2021. So I hope you're gonna benefit from that. Um, okay, concerning this journal club, this is our inaugural event. So it is really a big experiment, but we are hoping this should be really a um, platform where you guys, the scientists can have a more um, type of a conversation. This is usually not very well done in webinars, we think. So we want you to, to, to benefit from that, to have more conversations. But uh, also we really want to promote the younger uh, career sciences. So we want this to be a place where they can shine, they can connect with newcomers, but also connect with the more senior researchers. Um, so today uh, we have here to moderate this session, Marisa Justina. I'm pretty sure you all know about her. She's a quantum engineer at Google. She is working to develop a, um, a quantum computer using superconducting qubits. And we are very happy that she's helping us uh, to moderate the session. So uh, thank you for being here, Marisa, and welcome to the screen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katusia, and thank you very much to uh, APS for organizing this, this journal club. This is a very 
unique opportunity, as, as Katusia said, to be able to uh, bring together people in a setting that we wouldn't otherwise necessar necessarily normally do, and in particular to give an opportunity for scientists, young scientists, more experienced scientists to all come together in, in one, one setting and have a, a good block of time for questions. So as Katusia mentioned, we're going to start with a roughly 20 minute presentation from Chris Wong, who is the first author of this paper, Efficient Multiphoton Sampling of Molecular Vibronic Spectra on a Superconducting Bosonic Processor. But then the remainder of the time will be open for questions. And so the, the goal is to really field all sorts of questions. We have almost all the co-authors of this paper on the call right now. And uh, so please, as you have questions, if you have questions during the talk, go ahead and, and type them in and I will be moderating those questions. So if some quick clarification question comes up in the middle, I will, I will uh, try to bring that up. Otherwise, we'll keep the questions to the end. And uh, Katusha, one of Katusha's wishes for this was that we have both time for some technical questions, but also potentially for some less technical questions that, that you may have for the co-authors of this paper. So um, that's, that's sort of how the next 50 minutes, 50, 53 minutes are going to run. And uh, with that, I will, would like to introduce Chris Wong, who is the, as I said before, the first author of this paper. Chris did, uh, well, came to Yale University in 2015 from studying physics at the University of Pennsylvania and at Maculay Honors at Hunter College and uh, has been working in Rob Shulkoff's group since then. He's already co-authored four papers of which this is uh, first author work that is going to be published quite soon. So with that, I would like to turn it over to Chris and we look forward to hearing this talk on a really very interesting paper that as I was reading it, I was struck by how it combines three kind of three three fields, which are each pillars in and of themselves. You have the 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 use of the superconducting qubits, which have been a, a constantly under development technology for for many years already. You have boson sampling, which really rocked the field of optics over the last decade or so. And, and then applying all of that to molecular simulation. It's really a, a fascinating meeting of worlds. So with that, please, uh, Chris, I'm really excited for your presentation. Take it away. Thank you uh, so much, Marissa, for the kind introduction. Uh, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you to the organizers for this opportunity. Uh, as they've said, you know, I really hope that this can be a space where younger scientists and people perhaps on the field can take away something useful uh, or interesting. Um, I first like to say, you know, even though I have a privilege of uh, presenting this work, uh, I'd like to acknowledge all of my collaborators, uh, and I'm very grateful to them because this work wouldn't have been possible um, otherwise. Um, okay, so I'll start pretty broadly. Uh, you know, us in the quantum technologies community, uh, we're really motivated by the development of a new computing paradigm uh, that has really strong uh, potential to revolutionize. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of applications, and so perhaps most famously uh, known is Shor's act, uh, integer factorizing algorithm, which has implications for potentially breaking uh, RSA-based encryption schemes. So implications for national security uh, and privacy. Sort of on the flip side, uh, you know, using the tools of quantum mechanics, we can actually develop protocols that can make uh, you know uh, communication and cryptography uh, even more secure but sort of is the focus of this talk and perhaps uh, a bit more historical context for where it all started. The simulation of uh, quantum systems uh, is a primary reason uh, that quantum computers and simulators were proposed uh, originally by Feynman back in 1982. And of course, this work focuses on uh, molecular systems and quantum chemistry. So I'd like to take a moment to sort of uh, uh, take a step back and look at just how indispensable, uh, and you can't really overstate the role that computation has played uh, in the history of quantum chemistry and all of its various goals and applications. So things like modeling for drug development, 
understanding the role of quantum mechanics in various processes such as photosynthesis and things like elucidating reaction and catalysis mechanisms uh, are all very interesting things. And of course, the list goes on and on. And here in the center, I have this, uh, you know, uh, an example. This is a cofactor and an enzyme responsible for biological nitrogen fixation, uh, turning nitrogen uh, gas in the atmosphere to uh, ammonia, which can be metabolized. And really trying to as, use this as an example for something that would really love to understand uh, the mechanism at the quantum mechanical level. Uh, but of course, uh, even though computation has been a pillar of this uh, of this field, uh, there are challenges, namely that if you really want to incorporate the quantum mechanical effects of, um, uh, and you know account for all the say electron electron interactions, uh, the computational resources required as your system grows larger really does become quite costly, uh, notably in this exponential scaling. Uh, so within the quantum technologies community, what's the approach? Well, it's to use a quantum computer. Um, but I'd like to first uh, describe a bit why that is, uh, on one hand, a pretty simple idea, and yet there are nuances uh, that need to be taken into account. Uh, and perhaps the thing I want to highlight is this idea of representation. So conventional quantum computers as envisioned and developed in academia and in industry manipulate qubits or spin one half particles which really means that the algebra that uh, they use are governed by the Pauli matrices um, here. Now, uh, I'm only listing a few examples of platforms that are used to develop quantum computers. And even though these platforms may use particles or atoms that themselves behave or that themselves are intrinsically either bosons or fermions, they're operationally used as qubits and lack uh, that <laughs> character. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, uh, of course, molecular systems uh, in real life uh, consist of all of these various degrees of freedom. You know, here depicted for fluoromethane, you can have electronic orbitals, which are fermionic. Uh, but then you have bosonic degrees of freedom, collective motion in the form of vibrations and rotations. Uh, and these degrees of freedom, of course, have to obey physical laws, you know, poly exclusion principle for fermions, and they manifest themselves in these various commutation relations. Bosons, for instance, can occupy, in principle, an infinite dimensional Hilbert space per mode. And so what this means is that because qubits are neither bosons or fermions, that there's a significant overhead if you want to map some problem, say, of a Hamiltonian onto a qubit-based register. And in the current era, where we don't really have fault-tolerant machines yet, uh, this overhead can be quite costly and can make or break uh, a computation. So, okay, great, uh, this is, uh, we, you know, I want to recognize the subtlety, but now we can actually ask ourselves, like, okay, so what are some things we might want to compute about a molecule or a molecular system? And the approach I want to take is sort of uh, take off the physicist hat and put on the chemist or spectroscopist hat and ask, well, what do uh, chemists and spectroscopists in the lab, how have they been approaching this problem for decades to try and understand molecules? And of course, spectroscopy is, is ubiquitous. And so the role that computation plays is we want to be able to compute things that can really be compared with experimental data. So here I'm just showing a representative example of the photoelectron spectrum of a dilute gas of water molecules. And there's, of course, information in the spectrum. You know, there's information in the peak heights, widths, and locations. And hopefully from then, those things you can glean uh, some information about the molecular properties. Okay, so moving forward, I want to sort of give a rough outline or a simplified picture for how, uh, how this spectrum might appear and convince you that it really arises from the coupling between the electronic and the vibrational degrees of freedom, i.e. why this is sort of called a vibronic spectra. So I'm going to take a simple case, say from one dimensions for a diatomic molecule, and I'm going to represent two different electronic states uh, here and draw their potentiality surfaces as a function of, say, the distance between the two atoms. In order to simplify the discussion a bit, we can take the harmonic approximation where we expand these potentials around the minimum and we can define a simple quantum harmonic oscillator with two distinct frequencies for each surface. A simple model for what an electronic spectra uh, does is sort of uh, can, be, um, can be see like so. So of course there are uh, large time scale the separation of time scales between electronic and nuclear degrees of freedom, and so an electronic transition in the nuclear space here can be seen as vertical. 
So what you might expect when you try and take a spectra, say, of this diatomic molecule, is you would expect progressions that are spaced by, say, the phonon frequency in the excited state, but whose amplitudes are these so-called Frank Bonin factors. And they're nothing more than the overlap integrals between your initial state, here the vibrational ground state, with your final setting states in the upper surface. And so this is uh, a simple picture for how you can actually get a spectrum uh, from an underlying potential. But if you want to compute these things, there are two main steps. First, you have to solve the fermionic problem. You need to compute the potential energy surface by solving the electronic Hamiltonian in particle. You can make these approximations uh, to put it in a harmonic uh, basis. And from that, you can glean um, parameters such as the frequencies of these modes and how they're related to each other in the sense that they can be displaced from each other and in higher dimensions actually be rotated into each other. And the approach for uh, computing these potential energy surfaces, of course, you know, classical methods still do prevail and have been worked and have worked very well. Uh, for small to medium sized molecules, but sacrifice accuracy at larger molecules sizes. Of course, uh, quantum uh, approaches are very attractive for this reason as well. Uh, and that's a, you know, a huge effort in the community to try and use quantum technologies to compute these electronic energies. Then the next step after you've computed the surface is the bosonic problem where you can take these, this information from these parameters and compute these Frank Conan factors to obtain the spectra. And of course, uh, for many, many years, there are classical algorithms that are largely based on recursive methods that have been used for this approach. And in this work, we wanna talk about the quantum mechanical way. But you can do that uh, with, uh, with photonic technology. Okay, um, so I wanna quickly go through what that algorithm looks like from the perspective of a bosonic processor. And so again, I've mentioned that the thing you actually wanna calculate are these frank Conan factors. And in this case, again, it's this overlap between this Gaussian initial state uh, with the final set of eigenstates in the photon uh, or bosonic number basis. And so the approach here, uh, which was originally uh, proposed by the Asperu Guzik group back in 2015, is to uh, relate these to uh, under the harmonic approximation with a Gaussian basis change. And so in this case, you can see, uh, or you can show that these two surfaces are related to each other by a squeezing operation, which can sort of, you can literally think of as squeezing uh, this, this potential. And then, it's, and now what you've done is you've created a state for which if you just sample the uh, photon or boson number probabilities repeatedly, you can actually acquire these emergent frank Conan factors. It's worth noting that in higher dimensions, this still works. You just need to incorporate uh, extra operations such as rotations in order to account for couplings between the modes. And so this, sorts of, this sort of brings us to the list of requirements as outlined in this work. You of course need bosonic modes to implement this algorithm. You need a full set of Gaussian operations to enact this unitary transformation. If you wanna do this algorithm from say, not the vibrational ground state, but vibrational excited states, you would like to have non-Gaussian state preparation. And finally, because you actually want to measure uh, in the photon number basis, because there can in principle be many uh, photons per mode or phonons per mode, uh, you actually need number resolved detection. Uh, and this is a very key uh, aspect, which I'll go into later. But notably, the reason why this has been challenging uh, and not really demonstrated to full effect since this was proposed in 2015 in an optical system is that thus far there are still elements that are a bit challenging to realize in those systems, namely squeezing and this number result detection. And so our approach here is instead of using optical photons, we actually want to use microwave photons. And instead of being uh, in optical waveguides, they're confined in the superconducting microwave cavities. So here is a picture of our device on the right. There are two three-dimensional aluminum um, microwave cavities that are mediated by this transmon superconducting qubit in the middle. And in this case, again, one photon in each of these cavities is meant to represent one molecular vibrational quanta here for either the symmetric stretch or the symmetric, symmetric bend mode of a class of triatomic molecules. Okay, and so you can ask, okay, why again exactly are we using microwave photons? Well, on one hand, uh, we actually check off all the boxes with this technology. Um, notably, 
uh, the Gaussian operations are readily available by using the forward mixing capabilities of this nonlinear non coupling element. Furthermore, non-Gaussian state preparation is afforded to us by using optimal control techniques uh, that have been developed previously. Uh, but as I said before, uh, it's really this number resolved detection that will make or break this algorithm because as I hope to show you, if you don't have this capability, then you can't do this experiment in a scalable way and thus have removed any hope of having an advantage of using a quantum mechanical system in the first place. The second question you might ask is how can a proposal that was meant for optical photons actually work with microwave photons? The energy scales are vastly different uh, and so it seems like there's a reason why that shouldn't work. And the short answer to that is because we're performing these unitary transformations, uh, there's an invariance of these eigenfunctions under this global energy scale. So you can actually recreate the situation that say actual vibrations uh, play in molecules using photons at vastly different frequencies uh, by accounting for the appropriate uh, unitary transformation of those states. Okay, so now I wanna quickly go into this uh, number of resolved detection that I've uh, talked a bit about. And before I wanna, uh, before I do that, I want to go in and talk about how we just detect single photons uh, in this architecture. So now each of these cavities will be pulled uh, sort of in this canonical way uh, in the past decade in the strong dispersive regime. This means that uh, a transmon and scylla, which you at this point can really just treat as a two-level system, will have a resonant frequency that depends on the number of photons in the cavity. This means that if you want to ask the question, do you have n photons in the cavity? You can do so, you can get the answer like so. You can initiate your ancilla in the zero state and flip it to one, the one state with a pulse at the frequency corresponding to n photons. This means that uh, if you are in, if you do have n photons, you will flip it. And if you don't, then you won't. You can de then detect this ancilla state using standard techniques and refer the answer to your question. This, however, is still really a binary question. It's only a yes or no. And you can maybe already start to see that if you have an exponentially large quantum Hilbert space, that if you wanna use this approach, then you will actually have to ask this question for each state that you're interested in. And if you have to query an exponentially number growing up states, then you've lost all your advantage. So the question we really wanna ask is, how many photons do you have on a given run of the experiment? And here it's nice because we can sort of uh, glean a bit from maybe a computer science representation and represent a number in its binary decomposition. And so for instance, six photons can be represented like so. And so the way that we ask each cavity, how many photons do you have? We will again, initialize the sensor in the zero state, but we'll do a clever thing, which is flip it to the one state if the value of the bit is zero or one using a numerically optimized pulse. Um, we can then detect the ancilla state using uh, standard VIA techniques, as I've mentioned before. But then because th this protocol is different than a photodetector, whereas the photons in this cavity aren't actually being absorbed, rather we're inferring it, the state through measuring the ancilla, uh, we can repeat this process by resetting the insula and continue for the other various bits. And at the end of the day, we'll have four bits, which we can use to actually reconstruct a photon number. And so a pictorial way to sort of demonstrate this is take now not a single photon state, but a distribution. What this looks like as you pass this state through a series of detectors is you will continuously project this initial distribution into various subspaces uh, of the eigenspace of all of these bit operators. And so in this case, uh, you can see how this state evolves after you, after you continuously, continuously project it. And at the end, you'll actually uh, single out six photons on that run of the experiment. Okay, so now we can put all the pieces together and look at a few outputs. Uh, and here I'm looking at the photoionization of water to a particular excited state of the cation starting in the vibrationless ground state of both modes. Uh, and here's the results, but what I really want to draw your attention to is exactly uh, the speed at which these results have been obtained. In our experimental apparatus, the effective repetition rate is about 300 Hertz. And so what that means for uh, the Hilbert space, def Hilbert space defined by this problem 
is that in order to take 30,000 measurements using the single uh, photon, the single bit extraction technique that I introduced first, it took about seven hours. However, using this number as all detector approach, the same number of samples really only took a bit under two minutes. And this is a drastic difference that only continues to be more drastic as you scale the system up. And the difference is exactly in the Hilbert space uh, that, that this system has. Now, of course, it's true that uh, this photon number detector, you'll notice, does suffer from more errors. And that's something that we're actively uh, working on uh, addressing and calibrating and trying to potentially correct in post-processing. But maybe a final thing that I'd like to allude to um, is that the program, the simulator is in situ reprogrammable. And the different uh, process here, for instance, for the detachment uh, of ozone really just talks, really just amounts to a different unitary transformation. And so here we're looking at this process, but now we're not in a state, but a state that has one quantile vibration in stretch and two in bend. You can see the spectra looks a bit more complex, uh, and it's because um, we're actually starting in a vibrationally excited state. And this is a pretty powerful capability because I think conventional methods uh, might struggle to start with, uh, with these states. And of course, in real life, uh, there will be many different states which you might uh, want to start with. And just sort of for completeness, uh, to emphasize the reprogrammability, we can really do any triatomic molecule that fits in the symmetry class. So nitrite and sulfur uh, work as well. Okay, so this is sort of bringing me to the end, and I think the thing I want to uh, end off with is a perspective on this research goal, which is really for efficient quantum simulation. And I think I wanted to emphasize uh, this, you know, this common uh, and widely used technique of co-design in experimental science, where theorists and experimentalists collaborate. The experimentalists, we can design hardware and try to expand the capabilities with the application uh, that we want in mind. And in this case, in the case of our work, that uh, amounted us to enacting squeezing in a high Q system for the first time, as well as, as well as developing this number as all detector. On the flip side, theorists can then go uh, and use these new capabilities and try and expand on uh, existing algorithms uh, to develop further. I think I just sort of want to leave off with that this isn't really, you know, unique to superconducting platforms. Uh, there are many other uh, approaches uh, that I think are also very interesting. And one that I like very much is this recent proposal last year for trying to combine the techniques of atomic physics using both bosonic and fermionic atoms uh, with the techniques of cavity, QED, and use an analog approach to address the fermionic Hamiltonian simulations uh, of molecular systems. And for me, this is a very appealing thing because I think even though the hardware isn't quite there yet to implement all of these things, having this uh, algorithm and this proposal can really motivate developments uh, in the hardware, uh, which is uh, you know, very much needed to move forward in this field. And with that, hopefully I didn't run too much over, I guess uh, it's a, a bit late, but I don't want to uh, thank my collaborators. I couldn't, you know, we didn't get to all take a picture together, but I thought I'd put it up here and thank you all for your time. And I'd be happy to take questions. Okay. Thank you very much, Chris. I never know how to do the, the applause thing. Every, everybody unmute and try to applaud at once or play a recording of applause, but uh, in, please, please hear applause for your, your great talk. That was, that was very, uh, perfectly to time and uh, very clear. So thank you so much. Um, we, I, I see questions starting to. Okay, one sec. So I'm, I'm muting everybody. Can you try to mute yourself again and just unmute when you are ready to talk? Otherwise, I have to mute everybody. Okay, I'll try to mute again. Let's see what happens. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, it looks like I'm unmuted now. So I, I see a question starting to appear in the group chat. And as, uh, as mentioned at the beginning, please feel free to type questions and then we will have, have people, I, I will moderate the questions and have people ask the questions. 
um, or you can raise your hand. There are a lot of a, a long participant list, so maybe it's easier to type the questions, but we'll we'll just see how it goes. Um, so I would would have uh, Matteo, you you have typed in a question. Would you like to unmute yourself and ask the question? Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So my question is just regarding the uh, dispersive readout. So when you uh, measure your ancillary um, qubit, your actual vibronic qubit um, that you're using to do the simulation doesn't collapse. So like you still keep the state um, uh, under evolution, I guess, is if, if I understand that correctly. Uh, Chris, Sorry, we yeah. cannot hear you. There you are. Um, yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, it's a good question. Um, yeah, so as we ultimately, if we do the full protocol using our ancillary qubits to try and measure uh, the vibronic occupation in the cavities, at the end of the day, on a given run of the experiment, we do end up collapsing the state to a definite photon number state. And it's true that along the way, as we do it in this binary decomposition fashion, every time we measure uh, one of the bits, we will project the full state into an eigenspace of that bit um, in each of the modes. So while the individual ones don't fully project you into a photon number state completely, the full protocol does in, at the end on a given run of the experiment. Okay, uh, thank you. Then we have another question from Randy. Randy, would you like to unmute and ask your question? I can also read the question uh, in the chat. Yeah, I was gonna say, if not, I can read the question or, or, or you can read Great. the question. So I'll, I will just, read it off, how many photons can be resolved with your simulation and how do you handle the uncertainty in photon numbers? Right, yeah, thanks, great question. Um, in our current work, uh, we can handle up to 15 photons in each of the two modes. And in part, that's because we chose to only um, synthesize pulses for those 15 photons because the molecules that we were looking at didn't really tend to have uh, more than 15 uh, photon occupation for the things we were interested in. In principle, there's no reason why you can't go higher. Um, it's just that once you start to, you know, increase the photon number to like 32 or 64, there are a lot of other technical things like decoherence that will really spoil the quality. Um, and in terms of the uncertainty in photon numbers, uh, I think this is a good question in the sense that we have to define the problem. And in this case, because we want to sample from this uncertain distribution, uh, the uncertainty will ultimately be in how many times we sample um, and the efficiency of that sampling. So because our goal isn't to like get a number, but to get a spectrum, um, our approach of sampling photon numbers uh, will help us build up that distribution, but it will ultimately always have some uncertainty from the statistics and the systematic errors. So I actually have a, a follow-up question to that as well. The, you, you kind of touched on this a little bit. The number of photons that you would feel comfortable measuring is of course limited because eventually decoherence hits you and so on. Um, when, as you would try to push this technology toward larger molecules and larger systems, um, what are you going to need to measure more photon numbers eventually, or or how will that limit impact this this procedure? Yeah, thanks. Um, it's a great question, um, and this sort of comes to like you know, when, when will this approach actually be better than classical algorithms? 
Um, and I think this is a situation where you would like to handle, uh, uh, it sort of depends on what you want to simulate and it's sort of hard to look at large molecules and their frank common spectra sort of as a whole. Different molecules will have different parameters which will require different photon number capabilities. Um, and so I think if you were a computer scientist, you might say, well, you know, 15 photon numbers, uh, 15 photons per mode is sufficient if you go to however many, as long as for instance, the rotations are complex or random enough. Um, so it's this weird thing where there's maybe a, uh, uh, an applications based criteria for what you require, um, as well as a like information theoretic place where it becomes challenging. Um, I think those will need to be balanced. So, but I would claim it's mostly, you know, you would want to scale it up as a first step. And it's not that we would need to really push the number of photons that we can detect much further. Maybe one more, more quick question. What parameters or parameter of the system drives the photon number needed up? Right, and it's primarily how these potential energy surfaces are, dis are displaced from each other. Um, it's, so it's this, rel it's this relative displacement of each mode uh, between the two different electronic states that primarily determines uh, the photon number as well as the initial state that you start with. Okay, thank you. Um, so we've got some more, more questions coming in. There's one from Yutaka. In the last part of your presentation, you talked about perspectives on the efficient quantum simulation. Are there in, any indicators of the efficiency or I, I guess, how do you measure the efficiency? Uh, sure, thanks. Um, and I think maybe this will be the last question that I answer and then maybe I want to uh, give it to my co-authors for giving them an opportunity to give uh, some input and, and speak. Um, so yeah, so I hope I conveyed in the talk that the efficiency comes from the time it takes to sample. And so I guess if my screen is still shared, I can go back to uh, this comparison where uh, implementing this number resolve detector enables us to directly sample from this exponentially growing Hilbert space, uh, which means that as the system gets scaled up, the amount of time that it takes to get a certain number of samples uh, doesn't increase and it's actually constant um, and is limited by basically the repetition rate uh, of the simulator. Um, so I would say that is the primary indicator of what efficiency uh, we've been able to demonstrate with this approach. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I see there's a raised hand. I'm gonna, I'm gonna start jumping around a little bit. There's, there's a raised hand. Nathan, would you like to unmute yourself and ask a question? Uh, yeah, uh, so if I understand correctly, one of the advantages of this approach is that uh, over say qubit-based uh, quantum simulation is that the true molecular systems that you're modeling here have these fermionic and bosonic degrees of freedom. And so you have to account for the interactions uh, governed by the commutation relations for the fermi fermions and bosons. Uh, it, and my understanding is in, in two dimensional systems, you can get additional types of statistics, uh, anionic statistics that interpolate between bosons and fermions. Could you use that additional degree of freedom in a method similar to this based on uh, uh, anionic statistics that uses that additional degree of freedom to model even more complex molecules uh, in a more compact manner, if that makes sense. That is fascinating. Uh, maybe I will let Steve or Ike or someone else answer that. Uh, okay, I'll, uh, this is Steve. Um, the problem of um, anions hopping around on a lattice, uh, the, there are objects whose um, the sort of quantum amplitudes can be tuned continuously between those of bosons and fermions. It's an interesting problem in and of itself in two dimensions, um, but not three. 
I don't see any obvious, it's an interesting problem that one could attempt to simulate on such a, a cluster of resonators, but I don't see any direct applications to molecular spectroscopy. Uh, maybe I can contribute something. This is Ike, um, Ike Chuang. Uh, Nathan, I, if I understand correctly, your question is about using such anions to simulate or improve simulations of chemical um, molecule behavior. And it's, yes. it's an interesting question, fascinating, because it's always tempting to use lots of physical resources in, that seem powerful to simulate other physical systems. And there are two parts to such simulations generically, like Chris showed. There's the state. You want to map the state of the system you want to simulate onto the state of the physical system you have. But there's also the dynamics. And the dynamics of anions arguably don't map very well to the dynamics of molecules because they have different dynamics. They have different global symmetries. They have different conserved quantities. And so even though you may have something that's very powerful, there's no obvious way, at least to me, to do that dynamic snapping. Maybe you could try. I don't know the answer. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm going to go back to some of the, the typed questions. There is one from Kevin about how you would do the work involved in directly mapping, for example, the atomic orbitals not occupied. Um, Kevin, if you want to add, add more to your question or, or have us just read it, yeah, feel free to unmute yourself to add more. Okay, uh, in that case, would one of the co-authors like to, to take a stab at this? I will read the question out fully again. Do you guys have a machine learning platform to do the excessive work involved in mapping, for example, atomic orbitals not occupied, perhaps a base for QRAM possibilities? I think Jessica and Victor might be our local machine learning experts, and I think Liang knows a lot about QRAM, so maybe one of them can answer this question. Um, at this time, no. Um, this is something that we're always considering. Uh, this is Jessica, by the way. This is something that we're always considering um, in terms of how to move farther away from using classical systems to sort of precede our quantum systems. Um, I think the, the more we can sort of abstract ourselves away from that need for classical systems, ML potentially being a bridge, um, that is something that we're interested in looking into. Thank you. I, I, I Hi, oh, this go is ahead. Leon. And uh, yeah, so just regarding the QRAM question, we're actually like actively investigating it. And uh, we actually made some interesting progress that uh, maybe QRAM can be, uh, have a more favorable scaling against errors and uh, also potentially like feasible to implement it with these uh, cavity systems. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there was a question from Christian. Does this hardware allow for the possibility of a quantum supremacy style demonstration with boson sampling? Uh, yes, uh, sorry, not yes, but um, uh, I think uh, quantum supremacy, I think uh, is pretty loaded. And from what I understand, you know, has a lot of implications for, or rather, there, there's a pretty solid, I think, computer science backing in terms of complexity for demonstrations of quantum supremacy. I think the, uh, uh, I think for boson sampling style experiments, I suppose, depending on who you are, you might be able to say that, you know, with certain with certain modes, 
with certain number of modes, certain number of photons, you could demonstrate quantum supremacy with boson sampling. I know this is an active area of theoretical investigation for finding approximate ways to, you know, push the limits on how large of a boson sampling machine you need to de demonstrate quantum supremacy. Um, and I think, uh, in short, in terms of does this hardware allow for that, um, it would need to be scaled up to, to many, many modes. Um, and I think the numbers for what you would need to demonstrate quantum supremacy with boson sampling uh, are quite, quite large. Um, particularly with this uh, even uh, liberal scaling that the number of modes that you need go to, to maintain the complexity of boson sampling goes as the number of photons that you're considering squared, whereas a more rigorous definition uh, will say that it looks like n to the fifth times some log of n. So I think th this question uh, is, is pretty loaded. Um, in short, yeah, I think you need to scale up the hardware for sure, uh, but then I think you also have to take into consideration all of the uh, yeah, different classical approaches uh, to doing that problem as well. Sorry if that wasn't a great answer. I, I think that was pretty clear and actually it, it connects well to another question I see on the list. So um, I will we'll follow up with Tom's question. Tom, would you like to unmute yourself to ask your question? Otherwise, I will read it. Tom asks, with your experiment, you have the advantage to simulate the spectra of species in states that are hard to access experimentally. Do you have candidates of molecules where your simulator would immediately give additional insight compared to current knowledge, or do you have to scale to a much higher number of modes first? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, uh, yeah, just to sort of jump in here. Um, I think they're sort of two ways to look at this um, in terms of uh, the problems that people are oftentimes interested in, um, in sort of hot topics of chemistry, I think we need higher numbers of modes. But in terms of are there, is there new knowledge that we can gain, um, particularly on smaller molecules? Um, if we consider the, the higher excitation states uh, that we could look at, those are particularly hard to get with um, current classical methods, uh, classical computational ab initio methods. Um, and so I think if we wanted to gain new insights into those, uh, those higher vibrational states, that could add some, some new knowledge. Um, but in terms of the hot topics, I think we would need some, some higher number of modes. I think I'll also Thanks add, um, sorry, uh, yeah, I think I'll also just add that. Uh, the other thing that uh, separates this current work from realistic systems is including anharmonic effects. So you'll note that we took a harmonic approximation into account uh, in order to have this elegant decomposition into Gaussian operations. In real life, uh, molecular systems aren't harmonic, uh, especially not in cases where they're interesting. Um, and so I would claim that that is also a primary uh, direction to try and understand um, how you could incorporate that uh, to better even represent, you know, small molecules accurately. Yeah, that could be done with the current number of modes that we have. Just adding that anharmonicity is not currently available to us. Great, thank you for, yeah, for yeah, that. Yeah. Um, just a, a, five, oh, a five cent uh, contribution to that comment that the, the problem of modeling and harmonicities in conventional high performance computing simulations of molecular systems uh, is still very, very challenging, even for classical computing. So uh, adding that capability to this platform would be very useful for the for the chemistry community. 
So at, at least on my side, when you were when you were first mentioning the addition of nonlinearity, Chris, your your audio broke up a little bit. Could you explain uh, in a in a nutshell what that what that would represent experimentally? As like what would you need to change experimentally in in order to get that functionality, and what would it bring you? Right. Um, so I think maybe this picture. Uh, Right, so even in the simple diatomic case, you would like to be able to represent the purple instead of the orange. Um, and what you would require uh, is a way to enact a unitary transformation from the eigenstates of the lower purple states to the eigenstates of the higher purple states. Um, and if you're going to use a harmonic basis, which is the basis of these microwave cavities, to do so, then you'll need to both represent these eigenstates um, in that basis, as well as this anharmonic, so to speak, unitary transformation. And that in the basis of harmonic elements would look like high order interaction terms uh, that are not just the Gaussian um, operations that are capped at bilinear uh, terms. So that is the approach that you would have to take um, while making sure that your approach is still scalable. Um, and I think in that way, you would definitely get a more accurate spectra um, compared to the harmonic one. Thank can you. Can I, uh, this is Rob, can I just add a little something to that? Uh, so, um, you know, I think one of the uh, advantages we see of this kind of microwave platform, right, is that you have uh, quite a flexible range of controls you can implement using the uh, electronics that you can program. And when you combine that with the Josephson junctions, which do give quite large nonlinearity and anharmonicity, uh, you know, I think there are quite a few prospects for implementing controlled uh, operations that would go beyond just the ones that are shown here in this, in this paper. Well, something we're, we're very actively discussing is trying to figure out, you know, which kinds of uh, nonlinearities would be most interesting to the chemists and at the same time uh, most practical for us to actually implement in, you know, future generations of this uh, kind of experiment. But as Chris said in his introduction, you know, the, the microwave domain has this extremely large nonlinearity as compared to the sort of conventional optical domain. And so part of this work, I think, was kind of figuring out ways to use some of that, even though we're only doing, you know, uh, squeezing operations here. But, uh, uh, you know, there is a wide range of other kinds of tunable things we can add in the Hamiltonians. And, you know, this is kind of a continuing feedback loop of like, well, what can we implement? And what did we really want to implement that we're trying to understand? Nice, thank you. That that is a uh, interesting context as well. Matteo asked was uh, asking a question, another question about benefits of superconducting circuits over optical photons. Does this uh, recent bit of discussion address your question, Matteo? Yes, excellent. Okay. Then uh, with that, let's move on to another question. Rajiv, uh, sorry, Rajvir says, uh, thank you for a great talk and asks how long it typically takes you to build your photon number statistics and how that relates to the decoherence time, whether that's a matter of concern. Right, um, so going back to this sort of comparison, um, uh, right, so there are a few time scales here and it's good to distinguish them. Um, these are the numbers here, 100 seconds versus seven hours for taking 30,000 uh, samples. Although I guess the relevant number there is the repetition rate for the experiment. But the control sequence for implementing a single measurement uh, of the photon number is, you know, takes roughly, I would say 10 microseconds. Um, to perform four sequential measurements uh, of the various parity bits. Compared to the decoherence timescales of the transmon, uh, which have, uh, you know, 
coherence times uh, ranging from 10 to 100 microseconds. But that is very, very short compared with the time scale, or that's rather short compared to the decoherence time scales of the cavities themselves, which are you know approaching milliseconds. So this is why we think, uh, or this is why we're actively investigating how we can look at the sort of um, whole process of measuring the photon numbers uh, relative to these decoherence time scales, noting that they're relatively small, and then trying to use techniques to um, correct those those errors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we have another question appeared from Jake. Jake, would you like to, to state your question? Uh, sure. So I was just wondering about um, increasing the scale of these experiments. So if you're planning to, you know, build more microwave cavities, and if you are, how far do you think you can push it in sort of the short term? And, you know, what are the things that are difficult about doing that? Right. Uh, am I going to build a larger thing? Yeah. Is it hard? And can you go all the way to many, many? Yes, it's hard. And yeah. So uh, I think that the, the challenge, I mean, I, I think this is a much bigger question as well. Um, and it comes down to um, honestly, a lot of not just microwave engineering and material science, but also sort of really a, an approach and vision to scaling. Uh, you know, how do you actually want to attack that problem? And I think different uh, groups have different approaches. Um, I think sort of in, at least in our group, uh, being in an academic, not just because we're in an academic setting, um, but the approach has been modular. So I think the idea is, you know, you can't skip. There are a lot of details for just trying to scale up, uh, you know, because microwave, microwaves are kind of finicky and they're very cool in a lot of ways, but in other ways they're very uh, hard to control as you make the box bigger. Um, and so I think the philosophical approach is to try and make these modules that you can connect to scale up. And I think the question there is, well, what is then the appropriate size for the smallest module uh, or smallest, largest, uh, smallest module that you can control to the best of your ability that can be robustly connected and scaled up. Um, and I think that number depends a lot on the architecture. So here I've shown we've used these three dimensional superconducting cavities post cavities, uh, but those aren't the only types of, you know, there are many kinds of microwave resonators that you can envision both with all, with all their different advantages and uh, challenges. Um, so I think, yeah, uh, to really answer this question, uh, we'll, I think, take a serious sort of survey of the different approaches, but of course, new approaches are always being developed. Um, and our team has a sector that works on, for instance, micromachine cavities. Um, and we think that could be very promising as well. But for each new design, there are a number of challenges that you have to overcome in terms of integration and scaling. Um, and these are all very great active uh, research questions that, that we're investigating. Yeah, cool, thanks. Um, so if you just sort of used the same technology as you used in this work, but tried to get more cavities to work, could you get to you know, you're at two at the moment, I write, I guess. So could you get to, you know, five or 10 without doing anything too substantial? I hope so. More than that, I would claim would be challenging, but that range uh, I would claim is reasonable. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Thank you for the questions. And just to add on to that, there are some very interesting uh, chemical problems, particularly tropolone, for example, that Pat is a fan of, that are, are very difficult to analyze experimentally that we think we can get some very interesting revolution, uh, resolution at the, the five to 10 uh, cavity size. Great, um, since we're running to the, to the end of the time, we'll take just two more questions. One is from Miller. Miller, would you like to state your question? Sure, hi, uh, thanks for the talk. 
Uh, I noticed that in your paper, there's a verification step that's based on post selection before the measurement. And I was wondering if you could sort of elaborate a little bit more on that and how much data you actually have to discard and the importance of that step. Great. Yeah, thanks. Um, this is very important. So the verification has two purposes. One is sometimes when an incoherent error occurs during the actual implementation of the unitary transformation, those errors will excite these ancillas to their excited state, which means that on that particular run, the unitary transformation is actually corrupted. Um, so the post selection is to both catch those cases to make the actual simulation data more faithful to what it was trying to implement. But then also as well, uh, if we can post select on these steps on these ancillas being in their ground state before the measurement, that also helps because in order to do the measurement faithfully, we need the ancillas to start in their ground state. In practice, uh, these numbers vary depending on the transformation that we do. Um, and is, you know, we keep in most cases, uh, if I recall, between 90 and 98% of the data, depending on which process we're simulating. Um, and so all in all, we're not discarding that much data, but it's definitely something that as you scale up, uh, you, you'll want to make sure that you don't, uh, you're not discarding a ton of data um, to the point where it's not, it's not so great. But, um, but yeah, that's very important. Awesome, thanks for the answer. Thank you for the question. Okay, uh, I know I said I, we were going to take two questions, but Chitali's question appeared right after I spoke, and I imagine she was typing while while I while I while I said we, I would cut off questions. So we'll we'll actually take uh, two more questions still. Um, it is the top of the hour, and I know that Katushia wanted to make one brief additional announcement. So actually, I will have her do that, and then we'll go back to the last two questions. Okay, in this case, let me just share one screen. Quickly. Um, Sorry for that interruption, but I've, I I know you wanted to get this in, yes, and I, uh, I do. People need to jump off at the top of the hour. I don't I, want to. Sorry, it didn't appear here, so I'm trying again. Okay, now I have it. All right. So I just want. Can you see the 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 slide? You can, yes. right? Yes. Okay. So I just want to let everybody know that uh, PRA is celebrating the 50th anniversary this year. And because of that, we are doing one uh, special interview, uh, July 7, with Ignacio Sirac on his milestone paper. So I hope you guys also come to see this one. I think it's going to be very interesting. So that's that, the short thing, just to let you know. So July 7, uh, you're going to see this in the web pages of the journal. So thank you. Thank you. That sounds interesting. Yeah. Uh, so we will jump back to, to take two more questions. One from Uwe. Would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Hi, Marissa, you're muted. Thank you. There's a, a army of leaf blowers outside my room, so I'm continue muting myself to keep from blasting everyone with that sound. I, so the, the question is, thank you for the great talk. And I wondered if your photon number resolving measurement is so much faster, can you gain anything by averaging for longer? No one stops you from running the experiment for a long time. Or is the spectrum already the one the experiment would converge to even if you did average longer? Yeah, um, thanks for the question. Uh, and this comes down to, I think, uh, a bit of, you know, w sort of an uh, unavoidable fact of sampling, which is, um, you know, there's always some precision in which you can get your results to. Um, I claim that you would never really use a quantum simulator to calculate specific peak heights to uh, whatever precision you actually want because no sampling protocol, a sampling protocol, uh, any sampling protocol will always need exponentially 
many samples uh, to get that error down. Rather, I think the utility here is if you can run the quantum simulator for uh, you know a not so long, you can identify where, for instance, the high weight amplitudes are. Uh, and if those are the things you really care about, then you can quickly identify them using the quantum simulator uh, and then go back and use whatever methods you would like classically to compute the very specific peaks that you're interested in. Um, but generally, uh, also, if the peaks are larger, then you generally just have to average for less. Uh, but if your peaks are really, you know, uh, delocalized and all of low weight, uh, then you will have to, to measure for longer. So that's sort of the, the trade-off uh, and the context I would claim for, for that question. Okay, uh, then we'll have one last question. Chaitali, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Um, thank you so much for the very nice talk. So my question is for the theorists in general. Uh, is it known that the simulation of a arbitrary sized molecule, uh, is it in BQP? Is it always possible that this is um, um, uh, efficiently possible on a quantum computer? And also how do you characterize the accuracy of your uh, simulation? Uh, I assume that generally it is compared with something called as chemical accuracy. Um, um, and I, I wonder how you verify this independent of classical DFT calculations. And by efficient simulation, I mean by calculation of ground states and excited states and uh, other properties that you chemists think are important. Perhaps um, someone else can jump in on the computational complexity question, because I admit I have not looked deeply into, into that question. It's a very valid question that I hope someone has an answer to. Um, but in terms of the chemical accuracy, uh, there are a couple ways we can do it. Generally, chemical accuracy is defined as um, accurate to within one kcal per mole, um, which are fun chemistry units uh, that you can look into if you're interested. Um, but absent of using DFT calculations, we will oftentimes compare to experiment. Um, now, it's important to note that some of the experiments that we may be interested in studying in this way um, are pretty hard to resolve experimentally. Um, and those are perhaps some of the, the, the quickest ways that quantum computation can really advance the field um, is by is dealing with these difficult to resolve experimental peaks, in which case, the accuracy question uh, can come back to the same question that we ask experimentalists, which is how do you know that you did your experiment right? Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Maybe you can shall I add, shall I add something about computational complexity? Uh, or Victor, do you, Victor, go ahead, please. Oh no, I just wanted to uh, emphasize that the accuracy we are interested in with regards to the simulations and the relative intensities of the peaks in the spectrum and to get that um, you know, perfectly well, and you need to resolve it permanent. And uh, then is that, that's what the complexity is about, right? the complexity of calculating it permanently. Right. Yeah, Chitali, you ask a great question because uh, as I'm sure you know, um, a quantum simulation of an arbitrary Hamiltonian is BQP complete. Mm -hmm. But the trick is that molecules might not be terribly arbitrary. And this is something that chemists like Jessica and Victor and Nathan uh, have been working on for a long, long time. And Victor's and Jessica's answers just now, I think, highlight the crucial thing. The key for uh, complexity is the question that you ask. Even though mm -hmm. you might say you want to get the ground state, that's not quite precise enough. You need to say, for example, what is the yes, no question you want to answer? And then you can actually define the complexity very well. If you want to simulate to only chemical accuracy and you want to say that's good or bad, maybe that's a well-defined question. So if I were a physicist, I would throw this back onto computer scientists and try to get some more computer scientists to come join this discussion and maybe these kinds of forums. And uh, maybe we can then really pin down what are the best questions to ask 
and the best ways to map physical systems onto quantum systems and vice versa. Thank you so much. That's very useful. Thank you. So thank you for all the great questions and, and the uh, interesting discussion also at the end. I, I think we're already over time, so I would, would wrap it up now and uh, hand it back to Katusia in, in case you have any closing remarks. That's good. Okay, so uh, yeah, just wanna thank everybody for coming here. So especially Marisa, it was very helpful to have you here handing this, the, the, the discussion. Uh, of course, thanks a lot, Chris, for the great talk and all the authors being here. And we would like to hear the feedback from the others. If you like this experience and you wanna have more of that, let us know, write to the physical review journals and tell what do you think about that? So thank you everybody for being here. It was a great conversation. Thank you. Thanks for organizing thank this. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. I hope everyone. to see you on July 7th. Yes. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.